So I feel, first feel like I should reassure you that I'm not a typical sci-fi enthusiast. Um, I did not even grow up watching Star Trek, and I have never read Isaac Asimov's Foundation series, and I didn't know that Star Wars was considered fantasy and not science fiction until someone soundly schooled me on it in college. So I am not going to come in here and start talking at you about a world that you have no familiarity with, I promise. What I am, as I mentioned last week, is a lover of myth and a believer in the power of human invention and creativity to create a better world. Science fiction and speculative fiction is just one way to use myth to talk about human potential and to explore moral and ethical situations that we're facing and that we may face in the future. So science fiction in my world is about who we can be and who we ought to be in the future because I genuinely believe that imagining a better world is the first step to creating a better world. So the media that we consume, particularly media that takes place in the future, I think can actually shape the world that we are working toward. So in 1966, Nichelle Nichols played Lieutenant Uhura in Star Trek. And this was the very first time that a black woman had ever played a leading role that took place in space. And a very young nine-year-old Whoopi Goldberg happened to be watching this show and apparently went running through the house screaming to her mother that there was a black woman on TV and that she wasn't playing a maid. She also said that this was the moment this was the moment that she knew that she had a future. The moment that she knew that she could be anything that she wanted to be. And in fact, she went on to play her own character in Star Trek, The Next Generation. I don't know if any of you ever watched the TV show 24, which is kind of the polar opposite of Star Trek. Anyone in here? I admittedly totally watched that entire show. <laughs> It is a terrible show <laughs> about, <laughs> it is just awful, about special agent, counter-terrorist agent Jack Bauer, right? And Count Jack Bauer is hunting terrorists and the clock is always literally ticking, like tick, tick, tick. And their lives are always in a grave amount of danger. And he often resorted to violence and intimidation and torture to achieve his goals. And Amnesty International came out with a warning about this show saying that they truly believed that it had normalized the concept of torture for an entire generation of people. I know, not great. However, it is also thought that this very show may have paved the way for us to have an African-American president because there was an African-American president in the show 24 and the actor who played him was pretty intentional about how he set about doing that. And there's a bunch of research that says that, yeah, in the white American psyche, it actually really helped us see and understand what that might look like. So hearkening back to last week, right, I want to remind us that our stories are powerful and they're also dangerous, right? That what we put out there has a huge impact on society at large, especially when it begins to be a cultural phenomenon. So activist Adrienne Marie Brown, who is the author of Emergent Strategies and Pleasure Activism, says this. She believes that we are in an imagination battle right now. That imagination has people thinking that they can go from being poor to being a millionaire as part of the American dream, right? Imagination turns bombers into terrorists and white bombers into mentally ill victims. Imagination gives us borders, it gives us superiority, it gives us race as an indicator of ability. And she says, I often feel I'm trapped inside of someone else's capability. I often feel that I am trapped inside of someone else's imagination and that I must engage my own imagination in order to break free. So several years ago, 
there was an article floating around on Facebook that was called, Why Science Fiction is a Fabulous Tool in the Fight for Social Justice. And the article was written by the same social reformer, Adrian Marie Brown, and also Walida Marisha, about their book, Octavia's Brood, an anthology of science fiction written by activists. And Walida Marisha says this about social organizing. Anytime we try to envision a different world, a world without poverty, prisons, capitalism, or war, we are engaging in science fiction. When we can dream those realities together, that is when we can begin to build them right here and now. So according to Imarisha, social justice is science fiction, a way to envision and then work toward a future that has yet to come to pass. Now, when I read this, again, this was a few years ago, and I've done a ton of other readings since then, but it really blew me away. I had never thought about that before. And so I bought the book, Octavia's Brood, and I started to learn about Octavia Butler, who I had never, I had heard the name, but I had never really learned anything about her before. So Octavia Butler was mostly writing in the 1980s, a time when science fiction was con wasn't considered serious literature and was dominated by white men. So Octavia E. Butler, a black woman from Pasadena, California, was the first science fiction author to receive the MacArthur Fellowship, also known as the Genius Grant. And her novels center around black female lead characters put into nearly impossible situations. So in her novels, The Parable of the Sower, and in the sequel, The Parable of the Talents, which were written in 1980s and then the early 1990s, Butler gives a dark account of the United States from the year 2024, which we're fast approaching. Funny. It is chilling. It is chilling in its prophetic accuracy. So I'm going to read you this quote that is from The Parable of the Sower, written in 1980s, right? which is about protagonist Olamina, and she is describing her least favorite candidate for the US presidency. Jarrett insists on being a throwback from some earlier, simpler time. Now does not suit him. Religious tolerance does not suit him. The current state of the country does not suit him. He wants to go back to some magical time when everyone believed in the same God, worshipped him in the same way, and understood their safety in the universe depended on completing the same religious rituals and stomping out anyone who was different. Of course, there was never such a time in this country, but he has a simple answer. Join us. Our doors are open to every nationality and every race. Leave your sinful past behind and become one of us. Help us make America great again. Yes, she really wrote that 30 years before they were uttered by our current president. <laughs> no, I get chills every time I read this quote. It's in there. Read it. Much of our science fiction is critical of religion. I don't know if you've read a lot of science fiction, but it's almost always highly critical of religion. And it sort of bases itself that religions are based in sort of a primitive notion of people who don't understand the causes, right, behind sort of life events. What's notable, again, about Butler's Parable of the Sower is that while she is critical of a sort of patriarchal Christianity, she doesn't take an irreligious perspective that most science fiction authors take. Instead, the parable series is actually about the creation of a new religion called Earthseed, a religion that rejects the idea of a sentient God but embraces the concept of God as change. This myth is the entire basis for the protagonist's resistance. It is her source of energy and hope. And Octavia Butler became one of the catalysts for the creative and social movement that's called Afrofuturism. 
which is a genre of art and music and collective action that focuses on looking at the future through the lens of black bodies. So professor and science fiction author Tanana Reeve Du, who teaches a course all about Afrofuturism at UCLA, you can actually take this course online. You should take this course online. I'll put it, I'll like write a little thing up with some of these resources if you'd like, but she describes Afrofuturism or the black speculative arts, right? Which is basically just the black science fiction, right? Speculative arts as bending reality, either in time or in space or in magic or in technology, offering a blending of the past and the present and the future to create another way of being. She goes on to say that it is empowering and sometimes frightening and almost always illuminating that Afrofuturism is not about escape. The black speculative arts help us map our way through the challenges that are both new and old as time. Challenges that have affected people for as long as we can remember. Because for African Americans, she reminds us, it is not the future that looms gray and desolate, but the past. So Afrofuturism uses visions of the future as energy for the current work being done. And by reading and listening and artistically engaging in Afrofuturist science fiction, we're better able to imagine a more just world, one in which women of color are the architects and heroines of their own futures. Because imagining that future is the first step in creating that future. So I think one of the difficulties that we're facing right now in our current political environment is due to the fact that movies skip this part. They skip it, right? Because it is boring to watch someone go through the daily agonizing tasks of organizing, right? So they take the slow, painful process of social change and turn it into a catchy 80s montage. A catchy 80s montage of groups being formed and armies leading to learning to defend themselves and scholars doing research and politicians convening in dark rooms and groups of young wizards practicing spells into the night. Sometimes they even just skip it all together, like fade to black, come back 10 years later and there's a resistance formed, right? It's kind of like that watermelon in our story this morning, right? If we just sped that up, it would look like the ants did no work at all. It just happened in front of our eyes, but that is not how change happens, right? Right now, we are living through the cutscene. <laughs> We're living in it, right? We're living in those dark years of slow resistance and small achievements and it doesn't feel anything like an 80s montage at all. It is daily living. It's daily resisting. And in those times, those are the times when the real changes are made. And I believe that years from now, we will look back at this time as a critical, critical turning point in our history. The slow, important work that we're doing today will make an incredible montage, right? More and more people are waking up to the institutional racism and bigotry and civil engagement is on the rise. It is. It's on the rise and people are marching in the streets. And there are movements growing like Black Lives Matter and the Black Lives of UU, and we're using social media to connect with one another faster than we've ever been able to do that before. What we need is love to sustain us. Patience and love and stories of hope, right? And so I already see a ton of hope in the changing landscape that is our fiction is getting put out right now. I don't know if you've been to a bookstore recently, but one of my favorite things and you know, good and bad is you will often see a sign that says young adults slash dystopian fiction. 
<laughs> like, that's all that's being written right now. It's just, just dystopian fiction for young adults. And I understand it, because we're already in the dystopian future. <laughs> we are. Dystopian fiction is a kind of science fiction that imagines a world in the most extreme social distress. And these books often exaggerate trends that are happening in our own worlds and allow us to follow the thread of what ifs that can give us clues about how we can avoid catastrophe. And while it used to be that science fiction was dominated by white male authors, it's clear that science fiction by women and people of color is on the rise. There are lists of them going around Facebook, find one, read stuff. The myths of our young people are reading and watching are already not like the ones that I grew up with. One of my favorite of the newer Star Wars series, Rogue One. Did you guys watch Rogue One? Oh, it's great. Stars a young woman, Felicity Jones, a Mexican-born man, Diego Luna, Hong Kong martial artist legend, Donnie Yen, and African-American Forrest Whitaker. Compare this to the original Star Wars series in which the only non-white character was Lando Calrissian, right? It's clear we are, in fact, making some progress about this whole fiction, moving forward, diversity thing. And one of the most recent and popular films that, that uses Afrofuturistic themes was Marvel's Black Panther, right? Did you, did you guys get to see Black Panther? Yeah. So director Ryan Coogler says this about it. He says, I think that the views of Africa and African culture almost are a direct result, usually, of colonization, and oftentimes are very limited in terms of time. It's explored only in certain chunks of time, and I think that because the continent of Africa and humanity on that continent is so old, then it's a horrible disservice to the people that comes from those cultures. This is still his quote. So I think Afrofuturism is a kind of response to that. It finds a way to bridge the cultural aspects of ancient African traditions with the potential of the future. And just looking at Africa and African culture in that context is refreshing when you're used to looking at it in the context that mainstream media tends to portray it. Right? So it's about time. It's about looking at cultures over time and not acting as if they only existed in these little historical moments, right? It's about finding that through line from history to the future. So we Unitarian Universalists, we really love to call on the Dr. Reverend King's vision, right, of a beloved community. And if you go and you think about what this vision actually is, According to the King Center, for Dr. King, the beloved community was not a lofty utopian goal to be confused with the rapturous images of peaceable kingdom in which lions and lambs coexisted in idyllic harmony. The beloved community was him, for him was realistic, and it was an achievable goal, right? It was something to be obtained by a critical mass of people committed and trained in the philosophy and methods of nonviolence. Dr. Dr. King's beloved community is a global vision, a vision in which people can share the wealth of the world, right? Racism and all forms of discrimination and bigotry are replaced with all-inclusive spirit of kinship, right? The beloved community in international disputes will be resolved peaceably. He wrote all of this down. There's like specific things that he visioned for this, right? And this is science fiction, what he wrote down. It is Afrofuturism, right? It's this vision of practical ways that we can get where we want to go. And one of the things that I love about being a Unitarian Universalist is that we don't believe in a single myth. We don't have a singular savior source who's coming back to create heaven on earth. Nope, that's our job, right? Our job is to collectively make of our lives a heaven or a hell, right? We take our lessons from lived experience, from the past, from the present, from the future, from religious texts, from science fiction, from six-year-old girls' imaginations, right? 
Our entire world is our text, and we get to use it to make a better world. The first step to creating a better world is to imagine it. So in the words of Octavia Butler, every story I create creates me. May we continue to write our futures together. May we do the work of the heroines and heroes of this time, and may we truly believe that we are the ones that we have been waiting for. Blessed be.